Okay, we are going to get into uh, the first section of the Voice of the Silence. All the words followed by figures within brackets are fully explained in the glossary under corresponding figures at the end of the book. I have taken snapshots of the the glossary, so we don't have to do that. Hopefully, we can. Hopefully, it'll be relatively seamless, and we can continue right on. And HPV and uh, classic style dedicated this to the few. Fragment one. These instructions are for those ignorant of the dangers of the lower itties. And if we look over here um, in the glossary, the Pali word itty is the synonym of the Sanskrit uh, cities or psychic faculties. The abnormal powers in man, these are two kinds of city. There are two kinds of cities. One group which embraces the lower core psychic and mental energies, and the other which exacts the highest training of spiritual powers, says Krishna in the Srimad Bhagavata. He who is engaged in the performance of yoga, who has subdued his senses, and who has concentrated his mind in me, Krishna. Such yogis, all the cities stand ready to serve. And uh, moving on, he who would hear the voice of Nada, the sound of sound, and comprehend it, he has to learn the nature of Dharana. And so we look at two here, the soundless voice, or the voice of the silence, literally perhaps, this would read voice in the spiritual sound, as Nada, is the equivalent word in Sanskrit for the sensar term. And dharana is the intense and perfect concentration of the mind upon some one interior object, object accompanied by complete abstraction from everything pertaining to the external universe or the world of senses. Very interesting. So having become indifferent to objects of perception, the pupil must seek out the raja of the senses, the thought producer, he who awakes illusion. The mind is the great slayer of the real, let the disciple slay the slayer. For when to himself his form appears unreal, as do on waking all the forms he sees in dreams, when he has ceased to hear the many, he may discern the one the inner sound which kills the outer. Then only, not until then, shall he forsake the region of Asat, the false, to come unto the realm of Sat, the true. Before the soul can see, the harmony within must be attained, and fleshly eyes be rendered blind to all illusion. Before the soul can hear the image, man has to become as deaf to roarings, as to whispers, to cries of bellowing elephants, as to the silvery buzzing of the golden firefly. Before the soul can comprehend and may remember, she must unto the silent speaker be united, just as the form to which the clay is molded is first united with the potter's mind. For then the soul will hear and will remember, and then to the inner ear will speak the voice of the silence and say, if thy soul smiles while bathing in the sunlight of thy life, if thy soul sings wherein her chrysalis of flesh and matter, if thy soul weeps inside her castle of illusion, if thy soul struggles to break the silver thread that binds her to the master, know, O disciple, that thy soul is of the earth. When to the world's turmoil thy budding soul, soul is used here, for the human ego or manis, which is mind, that which is referred to in our occult septenary division as the human soul, per secret doctrine, in contradistinction to the spiritual and the animal soul. So we have different, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about different s stuff here. So when the world's turmoil, thy budding soul lends ear, when the roaring voice of the great illusion. Thy soul responds, so we're talking about the, the booty, or Krishna, or, or Christus, 
when frightened at the sight of the hot tears of pain, when deafened by the cries of distress, thy soul withdraws like the shy turtle within the carapace of selfhood. Learn, O disciple, of our silent God, thy soul is an unworthy shrine. When waxing stronger, thy soul glides forth from her secure retreat, and breaking loose from the protecting shrine, extends her silver thread and rushes onward. When beholding her image on the waves of space, she whispers, This is I. Uh, declare, O disciple, that thy soul is caught in the webs of illusion. This earth, disciple, is the hall of, all, the hall of sorrow, wherein are set along the path of dire probations, traps to ensnare thy ego by the delusion called great heresy. And this is called Atta the heresy of the belief in soul, or rather in the separateness of soul or self from the one universal infinite self. And these webs of delusion up here, delusion of personality. Okay, so that's fine. We don't need to get into that there. This, O oh, ignorant disciple, is but the dismal entrance leading to the twilight that precedes the valley of true light, that light which no wind can extinguish, that light which burns without a wick or fuel. Sayeth the great law, in order to become the knower of all self, thou hast first of self to be the knower. And this tattva yanin, is the knower or discriminator of the principles in nature and in man, the knower of Atman, or the universal oneself. So, say it their great one, in order to become the knower of all self, thou hast first of self to be the knower. To reach the knowledge of that self, thou hast to give up self to non-self, being to non-being, and thou, thou canst, rest or repose between the wings of the great bird. A, sweet is the rest between the wings of that which is not born, nor dies, but is the Om throughout eternal ages. And there we, and we do have some additional stuff um, written down over here. Eternity with the Orientals has quite another sig signification than it has with us. Since a hundred years or age of Brahma, the duration of a Kalpa or a period of four billion three hundred and twenty million years. So that's what the uh, the Orientals and, and you know we're in the Occident. This is what the Orientals are calling uh, an eternity and the Om. The bird or swan, Kalahamsa, says the Nada, Bindu Upanishad, or Rig Veda, which is one, I think it's the first writer, translated by the society, the syllable A is considered to be its right wing, U, its left, and M, its tail, Arda Matra, half meter, is said to be its head. Bestride the bird of life, if thou wouldst know. That 12 here uh, says the same, not a Bindu, a yogi who bestrides the Hamsa, thus contemplates on Om, is not affected by karmic influences or cures of sins. Give up thy life if thou wouldst live. Give up the life on physical personality if you would live in spirit. So that's the, that's the sacrifice. That, that's the ultimate move is from, you know, from matter, the world of matter, to spirit, the lower three worlds. Three halls, O weary pilgrim, lead to the end of toils. Three halls, O conqueror of Mara, will bring the through three states. And these three states are noted over here. Three states of consciousness, which are the waking, the dreaming, and the deep sleeping state. These three yogi conditions lead to the fourth. And that is uh, into the fourth, which is Toria, um, that beyond the dreamless state, the, 
one above all a state of high spiritual consciousness, which it has been talked about in depth in the uh, some of the Hindu texts, uh, especially by Ramana Maharshi, and you could probably find a lot of that on uh, the Sum Summonary Jayasara's page and uh, listen to some of that. There's lots of works in regard to it, and, and they discussed, uh, it's discussed heavily, that fourth state. And thence into the seven worlds, the worlds of rest eternal. And these worlds, the seven spiritual logos, or worlds within the body of Kalahamsa, the swan out of time and space, convertible into the swan in time, when it becomes Brahma instead of Brahma. The higher as opposed to the lower, it has, it has to. So if thou wouldst learn their names, then hearken and remember. The name of the first hall is ignorance, avidya. It is the hall in which thou sawest the light, in which thou livest and shalt die. And the seven, uh, 17, the phenomenal world of senses and of terrestrial consciousness only. The name of the hall, the second, is the hall of learning. In it, thy soul will find the blossoms of life, but under every flower a serpent coiled. And this is the astral region, the psychic world of supersensuous perceptions and of deceptive sights, the world of mediums. It is the great astral serpent of Elephas Levi, no blossom plucked in those regions has ever yet been brought down on earth without its serpent coiled around the stem. It is the world of the great illusion. And it's also called been called the playground of the gods. The name of the third hall is wisdom beyond which stretch the shoreless waters of Akshara, the indestructible fount of omniscience. In this region, uh, the region of the full spiritual consciousness, beyond which there is no longer danger for him who has reached it. So that's where we need to get to, right? So if thou wouldst cross the first hall safely, let not thy mind mistake the fires of lust that burn therein for the sunlight of life. If thou wouldst cross the second safely, stop not the fragrance of its stupefying blossoms to inhale. If freed thou wouldst be from karma chains, seek not for thy guru in those myavic regions. Yeah, I don't think that's that's probably that's just not happening. And then uh, the wise ones tarry not in pleasure grounds of senses. The wise ones heed not the sweet tongued voices of illusion. Seek for him who is to give the birth. The initiate who leads the disciple through the knowledge given to him to his spiritual or second birth is called the father, guru, or master. The wise ones heed not, the sweet tongue of seek for him who was given birth, given the birth. Seek for him who is to give the birth in the hall of wisdom, the hall which lies beyond wherein all shadows are unknown and where the light of truth shines with unfading glory. That which is uncreate abides in thee, disciple, as it abides in that hall. If thou would, thou would reach it and blend the two, thou must divest thyself, divest thyself of thy dark garments of illusion. Stifle the voice of flesh, allow no image of the senses to get between its light and thine, that thus the two, the twain, may blend in one. And having learnt thine own ayana, uh, is ignorance or non wisdom the opposite of knowledge or ayana, flee from the hall of learning. This hall is dangerous and it's perfidious beauty is needed but for thy probation. Beware, Lanu, 
lest dazzled by elusive radiance, thy soul should linger and be caught in its deceptive light. The light shines from the jewel of the great ensnare or Mara. And this is in esoteric religions, the Demer and Ashura, but in esoteric philosophy, it is a personified temptation through men's vices, and uh, translated literally means that which kills thy soul. It is represented as a king uh, of the Mars with a crown in which shines a jewel of such luster that it blinds those who look at it. This luster referring, of course, to the fascination exercised by vice upon certain natures. We should all be pretty familiar with all this in the, in the real sense. So these se the senses it bewitches blinds the mind and leaves the unwary and abandoned wreck. The moth attracted to the dazzling flame of thy night lamp is doomed to perish in the viscid oil. The unwary soul that fails to grapple with the mocking demon of illusion will return to earth the slave of Mara. Behold the hosts of souls. Watch how they hover over the storm, uh, the stormy sea of life, and how exhausted, bleeding, broken wing they drop one after another on the swelling waves. Tossed by the fierce winds, chased by the gale, they drift into the eddies and disappear within the first great vortex. If through the hall of wisdom thou wouldst reach the veil of bliss, disciple, close fast thy senses against the great dire heresy of separateness that weans thee from the rest. Let not thy heaven-born merged in the sea of Maya, uh, or illusion, break from the universal parent, but let the fiery power retire into the inmost chamber, the chamber of the heart, the inner chamber of the heart, called in Sanskrit, uh, Brahma Pura, the fiery power, is Kundalini, and the abode of the world's mother, and the, uh, the the power and the world mother are names given to Kundalini, one of the mystic yogi powers. It is booty considered as an active instead of a passive principle, which it is generally when regarded only as the vehicle or casket of the Supreme Spirit Atma. It is an electro-spiritual force, a creative power, which when aroused into action can as easily kill as it can create. This is, uh, that is pretty telling. The World Mother, name given to Kundalini, one of the mystic yogi powers. It is booty considered as an active instead of a passive principle. Then from the heart, that power shall rise into the sixth, the middle region, the place between thine eyes, when it becomes the breath of the one soul, the voice which filleth all thy master's voice. It is only then thou canst become a walker of the sky, and this being skywalker or goer, as explained in the sixth, Adyaya of that king of mystic works, the Yanishvari, the body of the yogi becomes as one formed of the wind, as a cloud from which limbs have sprouted out, after which he, the yogi, beholds the things beyond the seas and stars. He hears the language of the devas and comprehends it and perceives what is passing in the mind of the ant. Uh, though I speak in the tongues of men and angels and have not love, right? Oh my, that is serious. Um, so tis, tis only then thou canst become a walker of the sky who treads the winds above the waves, whose, steps, whose step touches not the waters. And this is certainly above the astral plane, right? Up into the... The line uh, to the mental plane, and I'd say into the abstract. So before thou settest thy foot upon the ladder's upper rung, the ladder of the mystic sounds, thou hast to hear the voice of thy inner God, 
in seven manners. The first is like the nightingale, sweet voice chanting the song of parting to its mate. The second comes as the sound of a silver symbol of the Yanis awakening the twinkling stars. The next is as the plaint melod melodious of the ocean spirit, I'm sorry, ocean sprite imprisoned in its shell. And this is followed by the chant of Vina. Vina is an Indian stringed instrument like a lute. The fifth like sound of bamboo flute shrills in thine ear. It changes next to a trumpet blast. The last vibrates like a dull rumbling of a thundercloud. The seventh swallows all other sounds. They die and then are heard no more. When the six, the six principles, meaning when the lower personality is destroyed and the inner individuality is merged into and lost in the seventh or spirit are slain and at the master's feet are laid, then is the pupil merged into the one, and the disciple is one with Brahma or Atma, becomes that one and lives therein. This is after a particular initiation, if we're reading the, the Alice Bailey books. You know, or after, I mean, say, you could say after the transfiguration, if that makes any sense. But before that path is entered, and, and I'm just saying this as far as I understand it, so there's that. Uh, so before that path is entered, thou must destroy thy lunar body, cleanse thy mind body. So the lunar body, being the astral form produced by the comic principle, the Kama Rupa, or body of desire, and the, the Manasa Rupa, the, and we're talking about uh, the mind body. The first refers to the astral or personal self, the second to the individuality or the reincarnating ego whose consciousness on our plane or the lower manus has to be paralyzed. So we may be talking about even after the, the, the death, which I think is the, you know, the crucifixion, which is at the technically considered the fourth initiation. So that's all very interesting. But oh, we know where these planes sit, so that's fine. We have to work our way up there, and it's a, it's a long road. So... Eternal life's pure waters, clear and crystal, with the monsoon, tempests, muddy torrents cannot mingle. Heaven's dewdrop glittering in the morn's first sunbeam within the bosom of the lotus, when dropped on earth becomes a piece of clay. Behold, the pearl is now a speck of mire. Strive with thy thoughts unclean before they overpower thee. Use them as they will thee. For if thou sparest them, and they take root and grow, know well these thoughts will overpower and kill thee. Beware, disciple, suffer not, even though it be their shadow, to approach. For it will grow, increase in size and power, and then this thing of darkness will absorb thy being before thou hast well realized the black fowl's monster, monster's presence. Before the mystic power... Uh, Kundalini, called the serpentine, or the annular power, on account of its spiral-like working or progress in the body of the ascetic developing the power in himself. It is an electric, fiery, occult, or phahotic power, the great pristine force which underlies all organic and inorganic matter. Before the mystic power can make of thee a god, when thou must have gained the faculty to slay thy lunar form at will. The self of matter and the self of spirit can never meet. One of the two must disappear. There is no place for both. Before thy soul's mind can understand, the bud of personality must be crushed out. The worm of sense destroyed past resurrection. Thou canst not travel on the path before thou hast become the path itself. And this path is mentioned in all the mystic works, as Krishna says in the Yadashvari. When this path is beheld, whether one sets out to the bloom 
of the east or to the chambers of the west without moving, all holder of the bow is the traveling in this road, in this path, to whatever place one would go, that place one's own self becomes. Thou art the path, is said to the adept guru, and by the latter to the disciple after initiation. I am the way and the path, says another master. And also says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Let thy soul lend its ear to every cry of pain, like as the lotus bears its heart to drink the morning sun. Let not the fierce sun dry one's tear of pain, before thyself hast wiped it from the sufferer's eye. But let each burning human teardrop on thy heart, and there remain, nor ever brush it off until the pain that caused it is removed. These tears, O thou of heart most merciful, these are the streams that irrigate the fields of charity immortal. Tis on such soil that grows the midnight blossom of Buddha, the blossom of Bodhisattva, more difficult to find, more rare to view than is the flower of the Vogue tree. It is the seed of freedom from rebirth. It isolates the arhat both from strife and lust. It leads him through the fields of being unto the peace and bliss known only in the land of silence and non-being. Kill out desire, but if thou killest it, take heed lest from the dead it should again arise. Kill love of life, but if thou slayest tana, uh, the will to live, the fear of death and love for life, that force or energy which causes the rebirths, let this not be for thirst of life eternal, but to replace the fleeting by the everlasting. It's just the truth, all right? That's the mindset. Desire nothing, chafe not at karma, nor at nature's changeless laws, but struggle only with the personal, the transitory, the evanescent, and the perishable. Help nature and work on with her, and nature will regard thee as one of her creators and make obeisance. And she will open wide before thee the portals of her secret chambers, lay bare before thy gaze the treasure hidden in the very depths of her pure virgin bosom. Unsullied by the hand of matter, she shows her treasures only to the eye of spirit, thy eye which never closes, the eye for which there is no veil, in all her kingdoms. Then will she show thee the means and way, the first gate and the second, the third, up to the very seventh. And then the goal beyond which lie, bathed in the sunlight of the spirit, glories untold, unseen by any except the eye of soul. There is but one road to the path, at its very end, alone, the voice of the silence can be heard. The ladder by which the candidate ascends is formed of rungs of suffering and pain. These can be silenced only by the voice of virtue. Woe then to thee, disciple, if there is one single vice thou hast not left behind. For then the ladder will give way and overthrow thee. Its foot rests in the deep mire of thy sins and failings, and before thou canst attempt to cross this wide abyss of matter, thou hast to lave thy feet in waters of renunciation. Beware lest thou shouldest set a foot still soiled upon the ladder's lowest rung. Woe unto him who dares pollute one rung with miry feet. The foul and viscous mud will dry, become tenacious, then glue his feet unto the spot. And like a bird caught in the wily fowler's line, he will be stayed from further progress. His vices will take shape and drag him down. His sins will raise their voices, like as the jackals laugh and sob after the sun goes down, his thoughts become an army and bear him off a captive slave. Kill thy desires, then, you make thy vices impotent before the step is taken on the solemn journey. Before the first step is taken on a solemn journey. Strangle thy sins and make them dumb forever. Before thou dost lift one foot to mount the ladder. 
Silence thy thoughts and fix the whole attention on thy masters, whom yet thou dost not see, but whom thou feelest. Merge into one sense thy senses, if thou wouldst be secure against the foe. Since by that sense alone which lies concealed within the hollow of thy brain, that the steep path which leadeth to the master may be disclosed before thy soul's dim eyes. Long and weary is the way before thee, O disciple. One single thought about the past that thou hast left behind will drag thee down, and thou wilt have to start to climb anew. Kill in thyself all memory of past experiences. Look not behind, or thou art lost. Do not believe that lust can ever be killed out if gratified or satiated, for this is an abomination inspired by Mara. It is by feeding vice that it expands and waxes strong, like to the worm that fattens on the bosom's heart. The rose must re-become the bud born of its parent stem before the parasite has eaten through its heart and drunk its life sap. The golden tree puts forth its jewel buds before its trunk is withered by the storm. The pupil must regain the child state he has lost before the first sound can fall upon his ear. The light from the one master, the one unfading golden light of spirit, shoots its effulgent beams on the disciple from the very first. Its rays thread through thick dark clouds of matter. Now here, now there, these rays illuminate like sun sparks, like the earth through the thick foliage, foliage of the jungle growth. But, O disciple, unless the flesh is passive, head cool, the soul is firm and pure as flaming diamond, the radiance will not reach the chamber. And the chamber is the inner chamber of the heart, called in Sanskrit the Brahmapura. Fiery power is Kundalini. Its sunlight will not warm the heart, nor will the mystic sounds of the Akashic heights, these mystic sounds or melody heard by the ascetics at the beginning of a cycle of meditation, called Anahata Sabda by the yogis, before they reach the ear, however eager, at the initial stage. Nor will the mystic sounds reach the ear, however eager, at the initial stage. Unless thou hearest, thou canst not see. Unless thou seest, thou canst not hear. To hear and see, this is the second stage. When the disciple sees and hears, and when he smells and tastes, eyes closed, ears shut, with mouth and nostrils stopped, when the four senses blend and ready are to pass into the fifth, that of the inner touch, then into stage the fourth he hath passed on. And in the fifth, O slayer of thy thoughts, all these again have to be killed beyond reanimation. And this means that in the sixth stage of development, which in the occult system is dharana, every sense as an individual faculty has to be killed or paralyzed on this plane passing into and merging with the seventh sense, the most spiritual. Withhold thy mind from all external objects, all external sights. Withhold internal images, lest on thy soul light a dark shadow they should cast. There art now in Dharana, the sixth stage. When thou hast passed into the seventh, O happy one, thou shalt perceive no more the sacred three. And let's read this. This is pretty long here. Every stage of development in Raja Yoga is symbolized by a geometrical figure. This one is the sacred triangle that precedes Dharana. The triangle is the sign of the high chelas, while another kind of triangle is that of the high initiates. It is the symbol I, discoursed upon by Buddha, and used by him as a symbol of the embodied form of Tathagata, when released from the three methods of the prajna. Once the preliminary and lower stages pass, the disciple sees no more the triangle, but the abbreviation of the line, the full septenary, uh, seven. Its true form is not given here, it is almost sure to be pounced upon by some charlatans and desecrated in its use for fraudulent purposes. Thou shalt perceive no more the sacred three that we just talked about. 
for thou shalt have become that three thyself. Thyself and mind, like twins upon a line, the star which is thy goal burns overhead. The star that burns overhead is the star of initiation, the cast mark of, or devotees of the sect of Shiva, okay, the great patron of all yogins is a black round spot, the symbol of the sun now, perhaps, but that the star of initiation in the cultism in the days and days of old. The three that dwell in glory and in bliss ineffable, now in the world of Maya have lost their names. They have become one star, the fire that burns but scorches not, that fire which is the Upadi, the basis of the ever unreachable flame, so long as the ascetic is still in this life. And this, O yogi of success, is what men call dhyana. Dhyana is the last stage before the final on this earth unless one becomes a full Mahatma. As said already in this state of Raja Yogi, of the Raja Yogi, is yet spiritually conscious of self. The Raja Yogi is yet spiritually conscious of self and the working of his higher principles. One step more and he will be on the plane beyond the seventh or fourth according to some schools. He is after the practice of Pratyahara a preliminary training in order to control one's mind and thoughts, Count Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi, and embraces the three under genetic generic name of Samya, Samyama. Yeah, and I, I think I remember potentially talking about Samyama too. Uh, the right precursor of Samadhi. And Samadhi is the state in which the ascetic loses the consciousness of every individuality including his own, he becomes the all. And now thyself is lost in self, thyself unto thyself, merged in that self from which thou first didst radiate. Where is thy individuality, Lano? Where are the Lano himself? It is the spark lost in the fire the drop within the ocean, the ever-present ray become the all and the eternal radiance. And now, Lanu, thou art the doer and the witness, the radiator and the radiation, light and the sound, and sound in the light. Thou art acquainted with the five impediments, O blessed one. Thou art their conqueror, the master of the sixth, deliverer of the four modes of truth, the four modes of truth in normal Buddhism, suffering or ku suffering or misery to the assembling of temptations move their destruction and tau the path the five impediments are the knowledge of the misery truth about human frailty oppressive restraints and the absolute necessity of separation from all the ties of passion and even of desires the path of salvation is the last one the light that falls upon them shines from themselves O thou who wast disciple, but art teacher now, in these modes of truth, hast thou not passed through knowledge of all misery, truth first? Hast thou not conquered the Mara's king at Sai, the portal of assembling, truth the second? At the portal of assembling, the king of the Mara, the Mahamara, stands trying to blind the candidate by the radiance of his jewel. Hast thou not sin at the third gate destroyed, and truth the third attained? Hast not thou entered Tao, the path that leads to knowledge, the fourth truth? This is the fourth path out of the five paths of the rebirth which lead and toss all human beings into perpetual states of sorrow and joy. These paths are but subdivisions of the one, the path followed by karma. And now rest beneath the Bodhi tree, which is perfection of all knowledge, for know thou art the master of samadhi, the state of faultless vision. Behold, thou hast become the light, thou hast become the sound, 
Thou art thy master and thy God. Thou art thyself the object of thy search. The voice unbroken that resounds throughout eternity, exempt from change, from sin exempt, the seven sounds in one, the voice of the silence, Om Tat Sat. And that is the end of fragment one, and we'll leave it there for today. Thanks.